complicado. No sé. <coughs> Good day and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us for the fifth installment of the Clipology with the Masters webinar series. <clears throat> we will be starting shortly. If you experience any trouble during the webinar, please text 484-294-0255. This webinar is intended <coughs> for US and international surgeons. Please know that this webinar is also being recorded. A message from our ASCULAP legal team. Please, it, it, when you, in watching the, our webinar today and utilizing any of the products that you see, please always refer to the instructions for use for a complete list of indications, warnings, precautions, and other medical information. Our digital dialogue, Clipology with the Masters, will include surgical case presentations and techniques. Today, Dr. Michael Lawton is here to host the fifth installment of Clipology with the Masters. We'd like to bring your attention to our next upcoming webinar, which will be in January of 2022. We also invite you to join us at the BNI, BNI Live virtual um, hybrid surgery clipping course that will be occurring at Barrow Neurological Institute in March of 2022. I'd now like to introduce you to our host, Dr. Michael Lawton, who is the president and CEO as well as the professor and chair of neurosurgery, neurosurgery at Barrow Neurological Institute. Dr. Lawton is an esteemed neurosurgeon with various experience in cere cerebrovascular disorders. He has performed and treated over 5,000 brain aneurysms, 960 AVMs, and 1,000 cavernous malformations, including more than 250 in the brain stem area. He has, produced over and he has produced and published over 700 peer-reviewed articles. So without further ado, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Lawton. All right, Melissa, All right. thank you. Let me um, go ahead and share my screen here. Oops, uh, you have to unshare yours. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's uh, a real privilege to welcome all of you from uh, wherever you are tonight uh, to Clipology with the Masters. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome these two guys, um, Adam Arthur and Howard Rena. These are um, colleagues of mine who I've known for a long time. Um, Dr. Arthur and I um, co-founded a, uh, <clears throat> a course called the uh, vascular skills course in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, which is his home institution, where he is now chairman. Uh, and we did this for uh, probably a decade or so, um, com uh, combining endovascular laboratory exercises with open surgical lab exercises, plus lectures. And um, we uh, um, worked together on this project. It was a labor of love. And I got to be friends with Adam uh, through this. And um, Adam, welcome. It's great to have you. Um, Howard Rena is a, a longtime friend who hails from a fellowship here at the Barrow. Um, he and I have also known each other for, uh, for decades um, and uh, we're friends uh, and family, uh, our families are friends, um, spending a lot of time together. So it's, it's a real privilege to have um, good buddies uh, doing clipology together. And so hopefully, uh, um, not only will you learn from the cases that are presented here, but also you'll have some fun with us as we go through. Um, this is just a course from uh, that vascular skills uh, course in Memphis. And you can see Adam there on the uh, right of your screen with his lovely wife, Shannon, and some of the rest of the faculty that year. Uh, and then uh, this is Howard and I uh, in his um, 
Hampton's home, uh, enjoying the summer together. Uh, I think it was last summer. Uh, so um, I am going to um, exit and let Adam kick us off. Uh, so let me stop my screen share. And um, Adam, I'm going to turn this over to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Really fun to talk about aneurysm clipping. Um, I was going to uh, talk about uh, clipping aneurysms that were previously treated endovascularly. And I was going to try and emphasize um, some simple concepts. You know, as I think everyone knows, based largely on the study I sat, endovascular treatment of aneurysms has achieved a real prominence. Uh, and there's this panic that that means we're not going to clip aneurysms, which I don't think is true. There's this notion that when you coil an aneurysm, you're completely filling it, but you're not. Uh, this is a, a silicon model and it's a poorly coiled aneurysm, but it looks like it's reasonably well coiled. And maybe there's not a lot of blood getting to the dome, but even the most well coiled aneurysm is only about 30% packed. So the point of this uh, video is that if you, if you are able to take the metal out, you can see that what really happens with the coiled aneurysm, this is exactly the same aneurysm, the same coil pack, is the same thing that happens with flow diversion. You're essentially um, causing stasis within that aneurysm. And, and, th and this is a, a dog lab study from Alex Berenstein's lab there in New York with you, Howard. It shows what happens with scarring, but since the coil pack doesn't actually shrink, what ends up happening is the same thing that happens when you when you close a wound, but the coils can end up in the subarachnoid space. So I'm going to show a case we did here very recently. Um, this was a, a child who came in with a bad subarachnoid hemorrhage. I was actually out of town, and so I, I can't take credit for how well this was managed initially. Um, it's a teenager, a 15-year-old who came in uh, in extremis with a fairly large hematoma um, just barely localizing, uh, withdrawing uh, on his right. Uh, and, and here you see his hem hematoma. This video is put together by Vince Wynn, who's one of our chief residents and just phenomenal. And so the, the strategy that they elected for here was to quickly put a couple of coils in this aneurysm to protect him from re-bleeding. It's a small aneurysm. I also think that the character of this aneurysm suggests that it may be partially thrombosed or, or you're not seeing the whole aneurysm. Uh, that's more common in my experience in distal ACA aneurysms, more common in children. And then our, our pediatric neurosurgeon, Stephanie Einhaus, who's a, a great pediatric neurosurgeon, took the hematoma out. And so this got him through his, his worst ictus. And now you've got a neck remnant. And I would argue that the appearance of this neck remnant suggests that there's probably more aneurysm there than you might be seeing. I don't know, Howard and Michael, if you, if you ever look at an aneurysm and think, hey, I think there's more to it than what you're seeing, but uh, this sort of narrow spindly uh, morphology, I think indicates there might be a little more there. And so about a week after his initial presentation, uh, we decided to take him to the operating room for an interhemispheric approach, not knowing exactly what we'd find being ready for a bypass if we needed, but simplest is always better. I love the interhemispheric approach. Uh, here you can see what we did. We, we found we were unlucky. We found there's a very large venous complex, but you really don't need a lot of room. Um, so this is the dissection, our total length of our interhemispheric approach because of that venous complex that we have covered with a little gel foam there to keep it wet uh, was about a centimeter and a half. This is a slide from the Roten collection. And the majority of this case was done by a, a great young partner I have, Dr. Nicholas Kahn. Watch this space. Dr. Kahn's going to be a leader in vascular neurosurgery. He just finished a fellowship with Jacques Morcos, a guy both of you know in Miami. Um, and he's just, just fantastic. Uh, I was standing in the room enjoying watching him work. Um, I won't belabor the point, but we're loaded for bear. We're ready for a bypass if we need to do it. Um, we get proximal control, we preserve the veins on the way in, and because this is not a long time after the coiling, which I think Howard's going to show, um, this is pretty straightforward. You know, I'm not showing you some crazy case that can only be done by five people in the world. Uh, here you can see the aneurysm safe, you can see the, the hemosiderin around it, almost like a cavernoma, um, pretty bloodless dissection. Um, 
you can see the coils, even only with seven days for this to mature, the coils are readily visible. I, I would argue if you give this another year or two, those coils are going to be in the subarachnoid space. Um, but here they're, they're really incorporated in the aneurysm wall. And um, long story short, we're able to get all the way around it and find that there is indeed thrombus next to the coil. You can see that there. There was more to the aneurysm. On the angio, the aneurysm was only five or six millimeters in the operating room. It was more like 10. Uh, and uh, getting the distal exposure to make sure we've got the afferent and efferent branches. So Nick um, got a, a, a clip on this and got good visibility, circumferential dissection. Um, I really love the, the, the concept of a pilot clip. Here's a slightly curved clip. Um, and we're not trying to get this perfect. We're not trying to over clip it. Uh, we wanna make sure that this is uh, not being pushed down by the coils. Here you can see the effort to make sure that the coils are separated from the neck and not pushing the clip down. Uh, and uh, inspection to make sure that we have what we need, a second clip. I learned early in my career, you guys probably did too. If one clip is good, two clips is usually better. Um, I think so interoperative angiography has become a big part of our practice here over the years. Inspection, there's the interoperative angiogram, AP and lateral. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I love that in this case, the challenge was these bridging veins, and yet that challenge really wasn't a big deal. We could go around them and, and didn't take any veins at all in the approach. Um, I have a second case where we clipped a, a web-treated aneurysm, but I want to make sure that I leave time for discussion and don't, um, don't hog all the oxygen. Yeah. So well, let's, let's pause um, <clears throat> there and just uh, talk a little bit about that, because um, I, I think this idea of a, coil, a coiling acutely and protecting the dome and not going for a curative coiling is um, interesting. We did uh, a fair amount of this um, way back in uh, San Francisco um, when I was there. And, um, you know, I guess the question that I've always struggled with is that how, how safe is it really? You know, you put a coil in there and it's an undercoiling deliberately so that you, you save room at the neck for your clip later. And the question really becomes, do you um, um, set yourself up for a rehemorrhage in that waiting phase? And is there data that answers that question for us? You want me to speak a little bit or Adam, or you wanna? You go ahead, Howard. So what, what I would say is, first of all, when we've done that, um, it's usually when we think, so if we're going for an endovascular approach, and we're going to fill an aneurysm with coils. At the time, we didn't have, you know, we, we didn't want to use dual antiplatelets. And so that sort of limited us for stents and flow diverters and things like that. Certainly, you could use balloons, but um, it, for us, it was sort of setting them up so that we could come back when they were outside of the acute period of vasospasm or needing ventrix and things like that. And then you could decide whether or not you wanted to put a stent or a flow diverter in or do a craniotomy and clipping. So I think that was sort of the, the, the idea for aneurysms that had a little bit more of a complex type of knee, uh, neck. And, and that's sort of how we sort of addressed it. It wasn't that we were necessarily going in planning that. It's just that when we were in there and you, you tried to coil it as best you could to get them through this acute period of vasospasm, particularly if they were poor grade, um, and then you were left with this sort of thing six weeks later and how were you gonna get rid of it? Yeah, Michael, I don't think there's good epidemiological, you know, evidence for this strategy for thousands of patients. I mean, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is rare enough that that's tough to do. But what I will say is that I have the opinion that nicotine, cocaine, and dogma are very bad for aneurysm patients. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that this is a strategy that should be employed in every case, but when a 15-year-old comes in with a very bad neurologic exam and a hematoma over the weekend when maybe your best, you know, vascular folks aren't readily available, I, I think what was done for this young man was, was really good. 
Um, the distal portion of the aneurysm is well protected. You can see that angiographically. And it enabled us to do a surgery that relies upon good subarachnoid exposure, bloodless dissection in a situation where the brain is not hot and swollen and you're not operating at two o'clock in the morning. So um, like I said, I, I, this is not something we do every day, but I think yeah, it's I, a strategy that's, that's useful from time to time. Yeah, I, when I think back on those cases we did um, with the same strategy, there were no hemorrhages in the waiting period. Um, we, we usually jumped on it pretty quick as you did, uh, which is another question I wanna ask you about. But um, in, in that waiting period, which varied from as few days as three to five to as many days as two weeks, um, we, I, I don't remember any uh, hemorrhages during that window. So I, I think there's something to this. It's just, um, it would be nice to know whether that um, single coil or that initial treatment changes the natural history. I, I, Fairly certain that it does, but to what extent? Um, the other question is timing. You know, seven days still puts you in the spasm window. And I just wondered whether, you know, you are comfortable with that or whether you, um, whether that was deliberate um, or alternatively, do you like to get out of the window and take them back at uh, say 14 days and operate then? Yeah, I mean, ours was much later. Ours was usually like six or eight weeks later. We'd come back. I have a little bit of a bias that younger patients with that sort of um, tall, narrow, uh, irregular aneurysm at the ACOM or distal ACA are at real risk for recanalization after endovascular treatment. I've seen that happen. Uh, you can coil it and think you're in good shape and you're not. You know, partially thrombosed aneurysms, if you suspect that's what you're dealing with, coils are not a very good solution. So I wouldn't want to wait months. Um, you know, it, it's individualized. Uh, this is a gentleman, a uh, young man who had mostly interparenchymal hemorrhage from his subarachnoid hemorrhage and an angiogram just prior to the clipping that indicated he wasn't dealing with significant vasospasm. So it was a decision we made in his case. We wanted to drain some spinal fluid, you know, let him get over uh, his initial ictus. And he's made a, a, a functional recovery. Uh, he, he's got um, a little bit of weakness uh, in his arm from the hematoma, uh, but is, he's walking and independent at 15 uh, now. So I've certainly seen that go worse. Um, but but if, if you were dealing with a situation and you needed to wait longer, if you're dealing with spasm, you know, I, 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 I agree with that. I just think that in a partially thrombosed aneurysm, I don't know what the exact time course is of the coils kind of expanding into the thrombus, which can make things more complicated. And um, one uh, additional question, just about technique. Um, this was nice because the neck was soft and no coils. Um, there were no um, issues with clipping a cross coil, but what, um, what's been your experience um, with that problem? Do you deliberately under coil to protect the neck and keep it free? Or uh, do you sometimes clip a cross coil or do you extract if you encounter that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, deliberately under coil and try and leave the neck if you think this is what you're going to have to do. So my, my partner, Nitin Goyal, who's a, a great young interventional neurologist, did this coiling and was very careful to keep his catheter at the neck and put coils against the dome and not try and make it perfect, which is a hard thing. You know, you want to make it look as good as possible. So it takes communication on the team. Um, if you have coils down at the neck, my bias is that clipping across the coils runs a real risk that you're pushing coils into the parent artery. So I'd rather temporary clip exclude and open the dome and remove the coils and, and leave yourself some neck to reconstruct. Or the blades might not close. You know, if you have too many coils in the neck, the, the blade, you, I mean, my case is going to illustrate all the pitfalls of trying to clip around a large amount of coils down at the neck. But, you know, if you're trying to get, you know, endothelial, endothelium to endothelium, sometimes you have to get the coils out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing about this technique is that um, coils have only been in there for days and uh, pulling them away from the neck and out is pretty simple, which is not the case if it's uh, two, three, six months down the road. I completely agree. And, and if it's months or years down the road, those coils really aren't in the aneurysm anymore. They're in the subarachnoid space. The aneurysm is healed down like a wound. The platinum is completely unyielding. 
And I've had cases in the fissure where there's coils stuck to the frontal and temporal lobe and it's, it's harder. Yeah. All right, great case, Adam. Let's do your next case. The uh, other case I was gonna show, Mike, you have seen, um, and it's uh, a technology that I had a lot to do with, which is the woven endo bridge uh, or web device. Um, so here were my pearls for this case. And I think we've discussed all of this completely. You know, we're, we're not dealing with just coils. We've got flow diversion, um, potentially really born at Howard's institution, NYU. And now we've got flow disruption. This notion that you can put a flow diverter, if you will, into a spherical shape and put it in the aneurysm. And it's really safe, um, but you can get recurrences. It's become very common in the US. It's very popular. Uh, Howard's done it, I've done it. You've, you've seen cases at Barrow. But there is a serious recurrence risk. We're very close to me having the data for the five-year Webit results. And I expect recurrence to be a major feature of that. So the group at Karolinska have documented this very well. Michael, I saw you put a case on your, on your social media feed not too long ago, but here's a 43-year-old woman with a ruptured MCA aneurysm that we treated with the web and we thought we got a good result, but she developed a very significant recurrence. She's a, a young woman and a significant smoker. This is not a well-treated aneurysm. So uh, this was the first previously webbed aneurysm that I... I uh, went ahead and, and, and brought to the OR for clipping. So I'm just gonna go quickly and, and show what we did here. Um, in opening the fissure, what we found, and we've only done a, a few of these cases so far now, is that the degree of scarring in the fissure seems to be less so far in our early experience. You asked about evidence, this is anecdote, than when you've got a coiled aneurysm. Here you can see this is a reasonable fissure and I'll point out that even though this is seven, eight months after her subarachnoid hemorrhage and web treatment, the, the, the character of the web is it's almost like a snowshoe. So instead of the aneurysm shrinking down and the web ending up in the subarachnoid space, the web is really held within the aneurysm. Um, so again, I'm gonna go quickly because I wanna see Howard's case, um, but this is us dissecting out the, the M2s. Again, you can see here, uh, we're paying attention to what we can find of the neck. We're paying attention to the branches. And here's an ICG that shows that there's really not flow on endocyanine at least, just as with angiography in the dome of the aneurysm, uh, but there is in the neck. And so this is a standard clipology uh, uh, approach to clipping an MCA bifurcation aneurysm, intersecting right angle or or sharply curved clips to come around the base. And this is a case where I had to fiddle with it a fair amount uh, to get the reconstruction the way I want. You can see that the base of the web is fairly compressible. That's something I think I learned. It's much more compressible. Howard was just talking about putting clips over coils. I think if this were the same volume of coil, that clip would be forced down onto the bifurcation. Um, but we found that we were able to, to clip the base. Um, and I'm going to go quickly again through this. But here's the ICG. Uh, so you can see that the, the, the aneurysm seems to be well excluded and the terminus seems to be okay. And again, you know, belt and suspenders, ICG, Doppler. Uh, and then I'll show you the angiogram at the end too. We were confident enough we didn't do interoperative angiography here, but here you can see the reconstruction of the MCA. So I suspect that at NYU, at Barrow, and other places, we're going to see uh, more of these. Uh, I think we're going to clip more webbed aneurysms. And I guess um, I expect that a lot of your clipology guests are talking about extraordinarily complex cases, bypasses, um, clip reconstruction, fenestrated tubes. Um, the point I wanted to make is that I think previous endovascular treatment isn't uh, something that means you can't clip an aneurysm. I've heard that argument in meetings before. Oh, it was pleaded, previously treated, so now I got to put a flow diverter in. Now I got to do this or that. Sometimes uh, I think about, Michael, your paper that showed that high-grade AVMs can be treated with radiosurgery and make it easier to operate on the AVM after that. 
Sometimes you're in a situation where previous endovascular treatment actually can make surgery easier, particularly if you plan for it. So that's the point I wanted to make. It's really interesting, Adam, and you've seen a number of these, probably more than anybody. Um, I I'm amazed that um, with the web, you um, have that device still so compressible. Like it's not causing or inducing central thrombosis like um, the coils do. So it, it, it's almost like it's a, a liquid core that you're able to compress with your clip. And, and is that um, what you're seeing? Like this doesn't induce the, the solid thrombus like you're typically seeing with coils? Well, I don't know the answer to that fully. I'd love to have histology and know all of it. I think where you've got a good result, you probably do have a very solid fixed endothelialized web. And we've seen that in the animal studies. But in a case that's six months out with a significant rec neck recurrence, there's probably a gradation between solid thrombus at the dome and, and full flow at the neck. So I expect the bottom of the web is more compressible in these cases. And that's what we've seen in the very few cases we've done. It's pretty interesting. I, I haven't operated on any of these, um, but, uh, and we have seen failures, but the, the interesting thing about this is, I mean, I wonder what's gonna happen long-term. You know, we have seen coils migrate through the dome. Do you think these will migrate through the dome? I, I don't get a sense of whether that's gonna happen or not. It had a very unusual appearance to me at least in those images from the scope you showed. You know, I had the same thought because um, I think the reason why coils extrude the way they do is that um, there's no uh, exposure to the bloodstream. There's nothing that reinforces or strengthens or preserves integrity of the wall. So the wall uh, involutes and the coils extrude. And I, I wonder uh, if that same process will be um, happening with the web. Well, I mean, well, you're arguing that the endothelium is going to occur because there's that surface where the blood is flowing by it. And so there's the scaffold. And that's what you saw in the animals. So it's interesting, but um, fascinating. Yeah, I don't know the answer. I, I, I will say that I've seen many more angiographic follow ups of previously webbed aneurysm where it looks like the web's been put in a trash compactor. So I think that when an that, aneurysm. That's, that's where we've seen the pancake. The yeah. Pancake. I think as an aneurysm heals and the collagen cross links, it probably, you know, sometimes the dome of the web gets compressed down to the neck and you look at it and you say, oh, that's a perfect result. Other times, and I don't know biologically how to make this happen uh, the right way, the web gets pulled into the dome and pancaked up and you got a major recurrence. Um, but I think it's healing that's doing that. And, and Mike, to your point, um, that healing is variable, right? So you know, at the neck, in a case like the case I just showed, you, you don't have a good result. Um, but, but again, uh, I, I think in, in some selected cases, um, you can get a very nice result with open surgery after previous treatment with web. Yeah, I think that's a really nice message. Um, um, but the pancake is, is intriguing to me because um, it's a little disturbing. You know, this whole idea of... Um, you said not flow diversion, but flow, what was the word? Um, disruption. Disruption, yeah. If, it, if it's disrupting, but it's, it's not strong enough to withstand the disruptive force and it pancakes inward on itself, then um, you wonder whether it, the device needs a little strengthening. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that recurrences happen uh, and it's not always because the web wasn't under good compression. Um, that's where you start to think about the the trade-offs between safety and efficacy. Great. Well, another great case. Thank you, Adam. Um, Howard, you're up. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here. And um, so this case I'm going to show you, it's basically a video presentation. And there's a lot to talk about with it. Uh, this is a woman in her mid-40s who originally presented um, after a motor vehicle accident was found to have this aneurysm. And the initial treatment was a balloon assisted coiling, partially at the patient's request. We were talking about, um, let me just uh, stop there for a second and go back to that one picture. So she underwent this balloon remodeling <laughs> and coiling. And you can see there immediately, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but she formed thrombus um, during the procedure, which 
at least at our institution, is a fairly unusual event. And so we gave a RIA Pro and we were able to, um, you know, get that cleared. You can still see a little bit of clot, but she woke up fine. And at a six month follow up, you already was seeing recurrence. Now, we can get into um, a discussion about aneurysm um, development and formation, but um, I've argued for a long time that what we're seeing in aneurysms is that the aneurysm itself isn't the only problem. And um, a lot of, in many, many patients, a lot of the vasculature is abnormal to begin with. And it's just that a combination of their abnormal vasculature and the flow vectors causes aneurysms to form but the, and, and to, to keep growing. And so clearly um, this is a, a failed um, coiling. And so coming back at this, you know, some people might say, well, you know, they wanna do a flow diversion, but the decision was made here um, to attack it with surgery. And a lot of things that we've been talking about, um, you know, today, um, you know, are come up or illustrated by this case. So the first thing you want to see is how, how the neck of the aneurysm is sort of interacting with, in this case, the, the A1 and the M1 segments. And so I don't like to use a lot of retraction, so it's, it's all being done by hand. But clearly here you want to expose the neck, and that's kind of what we're doing here is looking at either side. And you can see here, again, at the base, we're just sort of exploring that, that neck and trying to close a clip. But what happens when you put a clip on a big mass of coils is that there's going to be kinking and the clip itself is being pushed down um, by uh, the coil mass. And so that, that clip um, really wasn't doing a job. And so here I'm, I'm using a very well-known Lawton strategy, which is to stack and then maybe remove the first clip, which I probably learned from, you know, Robert when I was out in Phoenix um, back in 2000. So you have to remember that, at least in my experience, um, I was exposed to coils in 92. They only came out in 91. So I was a student with Dr. Berenstein and Alex in 92, and we were seeing, we were coiling some of the, those first aneurysms. And, and then when I came back to him for a fellowship in 96, we was, you know, we were, we were seeing a lot of those recurrences and we were operating. So here again, taking that clip off and immediately you see that coil mass is pushing those coils um, right, you know, back down. So that, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do it. Uh, so obviously if, and so here immediately you see taking, relaxing that clip you're seeing flow being restored to the, the M1 and the A1. And so, you know, this is a good size aneurysm. So the, the, the next strategy here is putting that temporary clip on and getting some of those coils out, um, out of the dome. And so the, the point here, if you're gonna, if we're talking about clipology and clipping is you're gonna open the dome. And I would say the, the, the classic mistake is opening the dome too close to where you're gonna to wanna to put the next clip. So you really have to be up on the dome to pull the coils out so that you're gonna have some tissue there to clip. And so here you see I'm opening up a little bit um, away from where I'm, I know the clip is gonna to have to go because I wanna get those coils out of there. I'm not trying to open up and remove all of the coils. And so here, this is just sort of, you know, if you want to call it aneurysmorphy or, you know, but you're opening up domes and there's, there's a pretty dense packing and this is about a year later. And so those, those coils are sort of pretty well um, organized with thrombus and, um, and tissue. And we're pulling pretty hard at that stuff down by the neck and, and trimming them, but you just want to get enough out of there um, so that you're going to be able to get enough tissue to close it and close the clip. And you know that you're, you're getting them out of the neck when you're seeing the blood, all right, because you know that, that it's open. Uh, and so that's a, it's actually a positive sign, but you're, we're working through, you know, a bit of a hemorrhage, but I know where the, the clip has to go.
And this is then just clipping the aneurysm like you would any other aneurysm that hadn't been coiled. And then taking the temporary off again to get the flow back through those vessels. All right, is that a coil still stuck in your clip there? Um, it wasn't, I think it was just one of the, in the field, but it really got rid of it quite nicely. So I, you know, I, I think that case illustrates a lot um, uh, about, you know, the different things that, you know, Michael talks a lot about in his lectures, um, one about approaching larger aneurysms, and this was a fairly large aneurysm. And so that was that first point about stacking clips, maybe even leaving multiple clips. But then also, um, you know, that mass, and it's a mass, it's, you know, that big coil mass has to be dealt with. One, it's hard to get around, but two, those coils have to be taken out of the, the area of the neck if you're going to want the, the clip to close. And so um, I, I think that was a, for me, it illustrated a lot. Um, that case, and that's why I showed that to you. Yeah, that's a really nice case. Um, it it uh, it's interesting. The the coils once they're in, um, they create a ramp, and um, no matter how you uh, finagle or finesse those clips, that uh, that trick of overstacking and removing the first clip, it doesn't work. And so you you really, um, as you showed here, you really have to get into this thing, and you have to take out that mass so that you alleviate the ramp. Um, the other thing that um, struck me in this case was that, um, you know, the ideal way to clip that aneurysm is actually 90 degrees away or in the opposite yeah, sure. direction. So that the blade, you always, um, I always tell the residents, you want that to line up parallel to the A1M1. Not right, but it would have been very hard with that mass coming back at, coming yeah. at it as a, a sort of a untreated or you know, a, you know, a not coiled, like a, you know, a, you know, a, a, a clean aneurysm, I think coming out of the side, obviously, is the classic, like you would a basler or something like that. But in this case, with that mass there, um, I think working from the side would have been more difficult for me anyway. Yeah, yeah, I think the coils definitely take away that option. And, um, you know, the other thing, too, that I've noticed, um, it, it's so, um, tempting to want to um, reach into an aneurysm, grab a, a strand of coil and pull. And I, I've um, found that more often than not, that doesn't get what I'm looking for. Um, it doesn't alleviate that ramping effect or the mass. And I, I find it actually um, uh, safer and better just to actually transect the mass of coils, cut right through them and try and um, lift them up as a, as a yeah, yeah, like an yeah, uncorking. Yeah. I, I could yeah, see that. Exactly. But I, I just wanted them out of the, the neck there. I think I thought the aneurysm was too big for me to completely remove all. There was a lot of coils in there. I coiled. I knew what went into that. Yeah. yeah. Any, you know, uh, I guess one of the benefits of that is the, uh, the coil mass has pushed all your perforators well out of the way, right? Yeah. So uh, you know, I was looking at that and, and thinking maybe more distal fissure splitting and more exposure of it. But, you know, you were able to get a gorgeous result, uh, really just looking at a very small window of the neck. Yeah, no, I, I know I, I, a lot of people like to open up very widely and all that. And I'm not, I don't do that for a lot of my aneurysm surgery. So uh, I like to go right to the, the point. I could, uh, you could certainly make a very good argument for that. Um, in this case, but obviously the video doesn't show. We did look around the entire neck. Um, there, there, you know, we did explore all the way around it before we were putting those clips on. I mean, this is a little bit of a condensed um, video presentation, but certainly you have to be wary of perforators and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, dealing with the big mass, I think that's a, that's a big issue. And, and I think in the web, these previously web cases, you're batting that thing out of the way because you're not, you can't lift the web out, or at least I don't know if you can cut, cut open the aneurysm. Would the web come out? I mean, so you're, you're going to be working around a mass 
and that's a that's a whole other skill set. Yeah, you're right. My well, I, I I think uh, you know these are individual cases, but there are some principles there that that are are worth considering. Um, you know, a different aneurysm, you you might choose a, a completely different approach to it. Um, but it's interesting that we both chose cases where you're able to clip reconstruct the neck um, despite uh, previous endovascular treatment. Well, Michael, I, I think you, it was the obvious choice for hybrid guys that do some clipping and coiling to, to show coil failures. I think we obviously were thinking yeah, along I, the same lines from Michael. I, what do you I, want I was going to show you. See? I'm trying to find a video that's um, you know he was going to show if he was going to pick his cases that's what he was going to show. The well, that's what I was going to ask. I know Michael, you keep track of your aneurysm clippings in categories. You count. He's got that. Do you, do you have a count on previously endovascularly treated aneurysms? How many of those have you done? Of course, of course, I got to count for everything. I, I um, figured. He's, he's um, got I, great I, videos. He's got coils going through. I think some cranial nerves. Don't you? You have a coil going through a, a third nerve. I can remember the cases. Yeah, no, I've got I've got a nice uh, collection. I think it's over 200 now. But you know, it, it's interesting. Um, we published a paper back in I think it was 2007, and it wasn't long into the endovascular coiling era. And you know, we plotted the cases over time. And I thought this whole problem of coil recurrence was going to just uh, explode. And as it turns out, it's just never it never did. And uh, things sort of plateaued off. It's really not um, um, the problem that I expected it would be. Well, um, Howard, do you have a, a second case or? I, I don't have a second case. Um, okay. Because I thought I'll, that I'll illustrated you. a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Um, let me show you this one. Um, this I thought was uh, an interesting one. Let me um, share my screen here. All right, can you guys see that? Absolutely. Interesting. Oh, oh nasty wait. little Ica aneurysm. Yeah, sorry, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, well, we want to see that one also. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll we'll do this one. Well, what quickly. was done here? Um, yeah, so um, I'll tell you in a sec, but um, just for fun, what would you do? Well, I know you did a. An end to end, you excise the aneurysm. I didn't actually. Really? I didn't. But you're you're warm. Um, here's what I did. I, uh, as you can see, it's a dolichoectatic. Um, it's uh, not one that had a clippable neck, and um, the uh, um, uh, it just wasn't uh, lending itself. So I I did um, an occipital to um, occipital to distal ICA bypass. So this is the, um, the occipital artery harvest. Um, this is the way I, I harvest my occipitals. Um, you know, it's an old technique that I learned as a resident, but um, um, kind of resurrected because nobody seemed to be doing this. It's the inside out technique where you raise your far lateral flap first, and then you dissect the, um, the vessel from the flap from the inside out. And it yeah. takes a dissection that takes normally like an hour and a half to two hours, and it makes it uh, really fairly quick. So once that's harvested, then this is just your- um, That's how we harvest our STAs, actually, from the inside out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very quick. And this is the ICA. Look at how ICA is actually really fused to the, the dura there. Uh, mm -hmm. When I first came on that, it had almost the look of one of those arterialized veins of a dural fistula, like a petrosal sinus dural fistula. But in fact, that was the, um, the ICA, and uh, the aneurysm is here. And um, so uh, the, the idea here is just to do a distal occipital to ICA bypass and, uh, and then do a distal clip occlusion. So there's that um, really adherent vessel. I did an IC green just to make sure I wasn't being fooled into thinking that was an, a distal artery. And, and then um, in fact, finding out that that was a dural fistula with an arterialized vein, but this is, um, yeah. you can see it, it really almost fused with the dura there. Yeah, fascinating, yeah. 
I had to peel it. You down. had the angio, so you knew it wasn't a fistula. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's the occipital artery, and um, this uh, is the uh, transection to bring it down. And then, you know, it's it's a, it's a really nice bypass uh, space. The ICA, I think a lot of people shy away from doing ICA bypasses because it's um, it's in the middle of the posterior circulation. But if you look, um, if you think about where you go in, you're going into the third segment of ICA, which is distal to the nerves. And um, uh, you can see it here, it's not so deep. You're lateral to the um, seventh and eighth nerve complex. And, uh, and there's the um, setup. I'll spare you the details here. This is just the- uh, That's beautiful. Finished product, and then when you've got this in place, then um, uh, the treatment of the aneurysm is easy. You just have to um, then go back and uh, do a distal clip occlusion. Yeah, you really did it end to side there rather than an end to end, correct? Yeah. yeah. So this is an end to side. So this is your SDA MCA style bypass, except occipital to ICA. So it's fish Good. mouth. Did you do that because that you know gives you a nicer tether of the ICA for sewing to rather than the free end? Because you could have just excite you you know cut it off of the aneurysm and done end to end if you'd wanted to free up more length. Well, there was definitely enough tissue with the loop, right? Yeah, um, the aneurysm is a little bit further down. If if yeah. you, um, I'll give you some panorama here in a minute after the sewing here, but it's it's deeper down, and yeah, I could have cut it free and done an end to side, but. Um, you know, this just seemed like it was right there and it really doesn't make a difference in the final analysis. Yeah, no, um, it looked great. The final we saw already, it looked great, so. Yeah, so um, so there it is. And uh, now uh, this is now going in for the uh, uh, distal clip occlusion. So I was able to get it a little closer. So any kind of perforators that were going to the nerve or into the porous, um, you can see how it retrograde fills to those now which uh, is a nice, uh, a nice little extra nice feature. Case. All right, so show us the failed coiling <laughs> that you were gonna show us. Well, um, it's not actually a failed coiling. This is a different one. Uh, it's unusual. Um, failed coiling, I, I, I was looking for it earlier and I couldn't find it. So I'm just gonna show you this one because uh, it's, it's interesting. Curious what you guys would do. So, um, this guy, he's middle-aged, um, developed a third nerve palsy and um, had this lesion. You can see it's, um, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's right in the interbeduncular fossa there. Um, you can see there's a large PCOM, I think that's on the uh, left side, and it retrograde fills back to this aneurysm. This is the CTA over here. And um, I think I have some more pictures of this. We have a vert injection. Yeah, there we go. So um, here's the vert injection. So um, what do you what do you think of that? You have a three D of what's happening beyond the the P one at the P one P two junction. Uh, we know you operated on it. Yeah. Um, oops. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, here, let me go back to this. I, I mean, I know what we would have done with this, but. Yeah, so. You would have, you would have put a flow diverter in there. Exactly. Yeah, so that that's uh, basically a very dysplastic um, yeah. superior cerebellar aneurysm. And you, yeah. you're seeing the outflow from the distal end through that thrombotic aneurysm. Sure. There's a, um, a very uh, atretic P1 on that right yeah. side. Sure. And on the left, you see a duplicated SCA and you see a normal P1. Yeah. We, would we would just flow divert it. And um, do, you, do you feel like um, getting through that thrombotic aneurysm um, is doable? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Same with you, Adam? Yeah. I think with modern equipment, it's, uh, it's relatively trivial to navigate through that and find your outflow. Yeah, um, well, I, I chose a, uh, a bypass strategy and this is, um, I'll just show a little bit of this. This is the, um, I did a clinoidectomy because I felt um, after surveying this that um, I needed to mobilize the uh, third nerve off of the top of the 
uh, aneurysm. It was really plastered on top. And um, uh, by taking off the clinoid and dissecting the nerve, I could medialize the nerve uh, more easily and create some space uh, distally. So there's the SCA. That's the second segment of the SCA. And you can see it's just coming out of that um, dolichoectatic segment. And this will be a, a very similar STA to SCA. There's the, um, there's the harvest. Here's the, uh, the prep work. Your standard fish mouth here. And then um, <clears throat> uh, that clip went medial to the third nerve in the carotid oculomotor triangle. But then I sewed laterally in this oculomotor tentorial triangle, which is a nice working space. And when you medialize the third nerve, um, you get a little bit of a few extra millimeters, which is helpful. And um, uh, pretty standard um, end to side technique here. And uh, you know, the beauty of this is once you've got that in place, um, the, uh, the clip occlusion of the aneurysm was pretty straightforward. Um, I just put a distal clip, but I also, um, you know, I'll show you what else I felt I needed to do. This is just uh, yeah. finishing that. So um, there's the bypass. Um, this is just confirmation that our bypass is open. The um, permanent clip is already on the um, outflow from the aneurysm. You see it in there. And so I, I wanted to also um, close off any P1 contribution to that aneurysm. So what you're looking at right there is the P1 joining that uh, quadrifurcation, and that just seals off any retrograde filling from the carotid circulation. So um, this guy did great. His aneurysm was basically uh, trapped, and his uh, bypass looked good. And um, he's a, an executive and did really well. He had a Temporary third nerve, but I saw him at six weeks, totally recovered. And, um, you know, uh, I'll show you his angiogram here. There you can see the uh, SCA coming in here and working its way down. And that aneurysm, there are the two trapping clips over here. I think it looks very nice. Do you have a, the regular angio or just a CTA? Um, I don't uh, have one to show you. I, I, we might not have done one. Nice case. All right. We've, we've got a question, which is, what is our opinion on the endovascular treatment of MCA division unruptured aneurysms and when this modality may, if ever, advantage over clipping? Well, you did show a MCA web that had failed, but we have MCA webs that have worked, right? And we have stent coiling, but I mean, uh, we still clip a decent amount of MCA aneurysms. Yeah, I don't know, Michael, uh, are, are there MCA aneurysms that are treated endovascularly in Phoenix or is that a never event? <laughs> no, I wish I could say it's a never event, but... Uh... No, we, uh, we've gotten on the web bandwagon, uh, Philippe and uh, uh, Andrew, as you know, are, are very uh, keen on doing those. And so um, I, I think patient preference now is the driver. You know, it's certainly, um, uh, we've proven that the uh, surgical benchmarks are high. Uh, we get great results. We can do these with minimally invasive cranies. We can even do bilateral MCA aneurysms through a single crany. We, we got all the tricks. And so, um, uh, I, I think we've sort of set the bar, but. So are you finding that your patients are coming in and saying they don't want open surgery? Um, no, um, usually when they come my way, um, they, uh, they like uh, the open surgical route. Um, if, they, if they start off with a preference for the endo, they often um, are seeing Andrew or Philippe first. Um, so, so the, the, the smart consumer so is they're self selecting are self selecting. Yeah. Yeah. I'll stick by, um, what I said earlier, I, you know, uh, Michael, one of the things you, you put out on social media recently was how much joy you take in giving opportunities to, to younger surgeons and seeing them take them. And, um, 
I love our case conference. We had an unbelievable case conference this week, all these complicated things. And I've got some phenomenal partners now who are talking about different strategies. So um, I, I don't know about the question about whether there will ever be a proven advantage. You know, I, I really like clinical research. I'd love to do a big RCT uh, and look right. at, at clipping versus endovascular therapies, but it's hard to find the funding, you know, to really do that kind of thing. And of course, expertise is different in every center. So well, organized, um, organized neurosurgery tried for several years, kept going to NIH and they kept ignoring it. They, they're more interested in stroke than aneurysms. The, the aneurysm, the numbers of aneurysms just aren't great enough. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I think you make a very, very good point. And I think Michael, you know, is talking about his young faculty and you're talking about your young faculty. I tend not to tell our junior vascular people what to do and and they they sort of fall into different you know groups uh, we do have Caleb uh, Rutledge who is doing a decent amount of surgery and a decent amount of embo he's he's been here two months and he's done 140 vascular cases which has been fantastic now a lot of that is stroke and angio but he's doing a decent number of aneurysms and ABMs uh, and doing a lot of surgery which is great so yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's no question that um, the uh, devices are just going to keep getting better. And Howard, I'm curious whether you think your new device would have worked for um, or is going to work for MCAs uh, in, in the way that the web is. But, you know, I, I was at a lecture in um, Austin that I think it was Dan Barrow who gave. And one of his concluding remarks, um, I, Adam, I think you might have been there, is, is that you need within a department somebody who is really committed to the open surgical techniques and is really pushing that because as soon as you lose that person and you have a, a division that's dominated by uh, one technology or the other or one modality or the other then um, you're, you're gonna one will one will decay and will disappear and so I yeah think well I think that's kind of the point I was making is that yeah. I don't tell people what to do um, you know I I clipped an aneurysm this week I mean there there there's there's plenty of clipping going on and open surgical stuff going on. I think we discuss cases at our vascular conference. I know the BNI has a great vascular conference. I know Adam has a great vascular conference he was just talking about. And so it's good to hear ideas bounced around and different solutions, but ultimately the person doing the case has to feel comfortable with uh, you know what they're doing. And so uh, if it's they want to do a, an open surgical clip reconstruction, then that's what they'll do. I think uh, I agree that you know you have to if, if you look if you're going to treat complex cases, you have to have all the tools available. Otherwise, you know that it doesn't make sense to have you know one arm tied behind your back. Let me ask you that first case that um, that you showed, Howard, that uh, bifurcation aneurysm. W would that be one that you would consider for your new device? Um, it's you mean the backstop. The backstop, yeah. The, the one that you're involved in? Uh, um, so first of all, I designed that over 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's just that it's, you know, coming to development now. Uh, well, I think it's it's a bit of a flow diverter. It's, it's, it's for this. It's a, you know, it's a flow diverter that doesn't go into the dome. Uh, so it, it might be good for something like this. It seems like yeah, that's geez. that's the perfect candidate. So exactly. Some, uh, terminus aneurysm that's yeah. um, at a bifurcation. Asthma tip, ICA terminus, yeah. maybe MCA bifurcation or a, a, a dominant A1 that gives rise to two A2s with a hypoplastic A1 on the other side. It could be used for any of those things. We'll have to see. We have to see what the final iteration is. You know? Yeah. The prototypes look interesting, right? Yeah, they look beautiful. So, well, um, we've reached the end of the hour. And um, any final remarks? Pleasure to see you both. I wish it was in person. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was great. Yeah. Um, the cases are great. I love seeing the bypasses, they're wonderful. Um, I think uh, there's still a lot of so many exciting, you know, we're all very fortunate. Basco is such a a richly rewarding field because, you know, unlike some of the other areas of neurosurgery, if you get the vascular right, the patient um, does really, really well. And, and I still get 
cards and thank you. As I have one patient who I clipped a ruptured aneurysm 20 something years ago and I get a, a card on her birthday every year from a different city in the world. So she goes to a different city every year and sends me um, a card. Uh, so th it's very rewarding. And I think that's, that's what our, you know, our goal is really to keep these patients doing well and living a full life. Amen. Well, um, thank you both for spending an hour. It's great to see both of you. Um, for the audience, uh, we're going to take December off, uh, but our next Clipology will be coming in January. And uh, as Melissa mentioned, we have a, a live surgery course uh, here at Barrow that's uh, on the schedule for March, which uh, you're welcome to join us for. Um, so um, with that, I will sign out and thank you all for coming. See you guys. Have a good night.